Hello and welcome. Um, welcome to another Q&A Live with WHO. Today we're going to be on Facebook, on Twitter, and on LinkedIn as well. Yesterday at our regular press conference, we talked about COVID transmission and from the questions we got afterwards and from the kind of coverage, we can see there's a lot of interest in the subject. So we wanted to give you a chance to speak to our colleagues directly. We'll be taking questions from the journalists and from the public as well. So my name is Nika Alexander. I'm part of the communications team here at WHO headquarters. I'm joined today by Dr. Mike Ryan. He's head of the emergencies program at WHO and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, who's the technical lead for COVID. Thank you both for being here. Um, so, uh, for your questions on Twitter, use hashtag AskWHO. Those of you who follow us have done this before. And on Facebook and LinkedIn, you can put your questions in the comments. If you're a journalist, please say your name and the outlet you are with. So let's start right off the top, Maria. Are there a few points you'd like to clarify? Yeah, so Nika, thanks so much for having us today and for the opportunity to chat with all of you. So there were quite a lot of messages that I received overnight and that we received about um, making some clarifications to some points that I made yesterday at the press conference. So I think it's important just to, just to if I can briefly cover some of the, perhaps some of the misunderstandings um, from what I said yesterday. So I think what's important related to transmission is what we know, uh, importantly, what we don't know, and what we're trying to do to really understand this very complex uh, question. So um, what we do know about transmission is that we know that people who are infected with COVID-19, uh, many develop symptoms, but there are some people who do not. And so the majority of transmission that we know about is that people who have symptoms transmit the virus to other people through infectious droplets. But there are a subset of people who don't develop symptoms. Um, and to truly understand how many people don't have symptoms, we don't actually have that answer yet. Um, there are some estimates um, that suggest that um, anywhere between 6% of the population and 41% of the population may be infected but not have uh, symptoms within a, a point estimate of around 16%. I don't want to get too technical, um, but that we do know that some people who are asymptomatic or some people who don't have symptoms can transmit the virus on. And so uh, what we need to better understand is how many of the people in the population don't have symptoms and separately, how many of those individuals go on to transmit to others. And so what I was referring to yesterday in the press conference were a very few studies, some two or three studies that have been published that actually try to follow asymptomatic cases, so people who are infected over time, and then look at all of their contacts and see how many additional people were infected. And that's a very small subset of studies. Um, and so I was responding to a question at the press conference. I wasn't stating a, a policy of WHO or anything like that. I was just trying to articulate what we know. Um, and in that, I use the phrase very rare. And I think that that's um, misunderstanding to, to state that, that asymptomatic transmission globally is very rare. What I was referring to was a subset of, of, of studies. Um, I also referred to some data that isn't published. Um, and this is information that we receive from our member states through either um, presentations that they give at member state briefings or presentations that are given to us through teleconferences. As you know, and as we've said previously, um, we convene global expert networks. And at many of those, we discuss a lot of ongoing research, ongoing studies that are there. And I was referring to some uh, detailed investigations, cluster investigations, case contact tracing, um, where we had reports from member states saying that when we follow asymptomatic cases, um, it's very rare, and I use the phrase very rare, uh, that we found a secondary transmission. What I didn't report yesterday um, was because this is a major unknown, because there's so many unknowns around this, um, some groups, some modeling groups have tried to estimate what is the proportion of asymptomatic people that may transmit? And these are estimates. Um, and there's a big range um, from the different models, depending on how the models are done, and where they've done, from which country. Um, but some estimates of around 40% of, of transmission may be due to asymptomatic. Um, but those are from models. Um, and so I didn't include that in my answer yesterday, but wanted to make sure that I covered that here. Okay. So that's a lot to unpack. It is. We know it's a, it's a new disease. Um, we're learning a lot about it. A lot of it is still confusing. As we learn more, some things change as well. So we're going to have a chance to get into that a little more deeply today. Um, off the top, you said there's things we know and there's things we don't know. What are for you, and for you, Mike, as well, if you want to jump in, 
What are the big questions that we would still like to understand better? So for me, related to this particular topic is, what is the proportion of the population that are truly asymptomatic? Um, how many people are infected with COVID-19 and really don't develop symptoms? Um, we know a number of them who are reported as asymptomatic actually may have mild disease. They may go on to develop symptoms, but we don't know. I mean, we don't have a clear picture of this. We're six months into a pandemic. There's a huge amount of research that is being done, um, but we don't, have that full, we don't have that full picture yet. The second big question is what what proportion of those that don't have symptoms actually transmit? And that's a big open question, and that remains an open question. So yeah. how many people may have been exposed to and had the virus but never develop any symptoms? Mm -hmm. And then amongst those, yeah. how much they are passing the disease along to others? That's right. Mike. That's a, that's a good point, Maria Mix, and I think that comes down to trying to determine um, uh, what is actually driving transmission at community level and what's creating uh, uh, severe cases that end up in hospital, end up in ICU. We want to save lives, we want to stop people getting uh, to, that, to that situation. So when we uh, advise people regarding comprehensive strategies to control the disease, we've been focusing on identifying suspect cases, testing those cases and ensuring that their contacts are, um, are quarantined. Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, studies will suggest that that's been a very uh, important intervention in this outbreak. And we've seen many countries using that as a primary strategy in linked to other physical distancing and other strategies, but that core strategy of doing that. And in, in that sense, well, whatever proportion of the disease is transmitting from asymptomatic individuals, and as Maria said, that is unknown. <clears throat> uh, and that is occurring. I'm absolutely convinced that that is occurring. The question is how much. But what we do know is that when we focus on detecting suspect cases who've got clinical disease and we identify them and test them and we identify their contacts and quarantine their contacts, that we can drive the R0 below one. We can drive, we won't stop all transmission, but what we do is we suppress transmission. And uh, in the, in the large-scale public health and social measures that were put in place, the so-called lockdowns, because many countries could not see where the virus was, there were so many potentially sick people, people with mild symptoms, potentially people with no symptoms, the decision was made, and I think correctly the decision in many countries, was to try and essentially distance everybody from everybody, put everybody in their homes for a period of time in order for the flames of the epidemic to, to die down and then go back to a more sustainable strategy of opening up, linking that to good surveillance. So I think that's what we're learning. What we're learning is if we go after the virus where we know it is, and we know that suspect cases with symptoms can transmit, mm -hmm. and we know we can find those individuals and we can isolate those in in individuals and we can identify their contacts, the real science challenge now is to fully understand what is the contribution of purely asymptomatic people to transmission and can we find strategies to detect those individuals um, and, and, and also control the spread of disease at that level? Uh, and I think that's where we're coming into the issues of new types of testing, faster testing, antigen testing, and being able to do larger scale population-based testing. The difficulty with doing that at population level at the moment is very few countries have the capacity to do that. So we have to focus our testing on those who we need to test most, health workers, people in, in long-term care facilities, people who are clinically unwell with the disease. So I think there is much to be answered on this. There is much that is unknown, but we know enough to support the strategies that have already been put in place and to continue with those strategies. So you're, what you're saying is as we get answers to these questions that you're identifying, we're still confident that the strategy we've recommended from the beginning is an effective strategy. Yes. And I think that's what we've recommended as a comprehensive strategy. Uh, uh, it, it's not do one, it's, it's do all of the things. It's the, it's the physical distancing, the personal hygiene, it is the surveillance and the finding of suspect cases, testing, tracing, quarantine, isolation, and, and shoring up and strengthening the health system so it doesn't collapse when there are so many cases coming through. Um, and in countries that have implemented those measures, in a timely way and done it consistent, consistently, sustainably, and have communicated effectively with populations. What we see in general is that countries that have implemented that type of comprehensive strategy, on balance, and, uh, have, done, have, done, have done better. 
So we said, thank you, we said we got a lot of questions overnight, and um, this is one question that came from Reuters, Washington Post, ProPublica, and Bloomberg, and they all want to understand better what you, you did say yesterday mm -hmm. and what we are saying about transmission. What is that based on? So that's a very good question because as we've been saying, you know, over time, especially for a new pathogen, this science is not static, you know, the evidence is not static, our understanding doesn't stay the same. We're constantly pulling in all information from every source we can. So the sources of information come from published papers, um, papers that show up in peer review journals um, that have gone through the full peer review, but we also in this pandemic have access to a lot of preprints. So these are papers that are posted online and that are shared with us, but it's before they go through peer review. Um, we have a lot of expert network teleconferences. So these are the groups we bring together for clinical management, for laboratory and virology, for infection prevention and control, for risk communication, for modeling. Um, and here is where we bring together hundreds of scientists and public health professionals from all over the world to discuss over the phone. Uh, regularly, uh, many times per week. Um, the latest information we have on each topic, our experiences with patients, um, with different types of analyses, with epidemiologic studies or clinical studies or laboratory studies, experimental studies. Um, we also gather information from our member states, from, from everyone out there. You know, how are you dealing with this virus? Um, what are the interventions you've put in place? Um, how is it working? Um, you know, what is your experience? And so that that is incredibly valuable because the practical hands-on experience from each country is really helping us to understand this virus even more. And then we have these specialized networks. You know, we have our, our strategic advisory group, um, the STAG. Um, so we have different specialized groups that we bring together. Um, and, and those are through teleconferences as well. But it's a constant revision, it's a constant evolution and debate, and I mean that in a constructive way um, of saying, again, what do we know? You know, what are the key questions? What don't we know? And what are we doing to address those unknowns? It's not enough to say we don't know. We need to, we need to actively pursue um, research studies um, to help us fill in some of those gaps. Okay, I'll, I'll take your questions from, from Twitter in a second. Uh, Mike, I'll go to you next. I just want to say, if you're looking, if you want to see where we're summarizing what we are saying now about transmission. You can look at the mask guidance that was um, published on Friday. We did a lot of communication around the masks. On page two, there's a summary of what we know about transmission. It's footnoted, summarizes what the sources are. So that's a good place. That's the most recent place for you to see what WHO has to say. And Mike, I think one of the things you wanted to explain as well is that it's not a, a WHO position. What, what do you call what we gather from all that evidence? What comes out when we state something? What are we stating? WHO has, has different levels of advice uh, and, and policy. Um, for example, as we speak, there are over 100 experts from around the world meeting virtually for the next three days. Mm -hmm. And their job is to go through every single piece of information, knowledge and experience gained in contact tracing for COVID-19 over the last four months. Uh, their job is to challenge each other, what, what's worked, what hasn't. What is the kind of training that's needed? What is the kind of guidance? How would, what is the best way to communicate with communities about contact tracing, which can often seem intimidating from outside? So it's not just the technology, it's how you implement it. At the end of that three days, I, gar I can tell you right now that what we think about contact tracing today at the start of that meeting collectively will evolve into a better understanding of what works and what doesn't. Uh, and that will then be added into our advice and our guidance and passed back to our our member states and to institutions all over the world. So that could be a scientific briefing or scientific advice, <clears throat> but when it comes to strategic uh, policy for strategy for control, uh, clearly contact tracing is, is within our current strategy. So any advance on understanding of how to make contact tracing more effective won't change our strategy, but it will change the emphasis of that strategy and it will change the quality and effectiveness and efficiency of how we do that piece of the strategy. So some of what we do is to gather evidence to see do we have the right policy and strategy? Are we taking the right approach? Mm -hmm. And some of the research and gathering we do is to make what we're already doing more focused, more effective, uh, save more lives. Mm -hmm. So it's not everything we do shifts 
shifts our, our policy. And uh, certainly, uh, Maria spoke yesterday, you know, in response to a question from the media, uh, and referred uh, to to a great extent to much of the material that's in in our in our guidance already. And that that certainly wasn't uh, uh, neither Maria's intent nor the intent of WHO to say there is a a new or different policy. There isn't. Mm -hmm. There is still too much unknown about this virus, there is still too much unknown about its transmission dynamics. But again, what we do know is when we go to try and detect suspect cases who are clinically unwell and we test those and we trace their contacts uh, and we isolate or we quarantine the contacts uh, uh, of those people and we do that diligently and we do that over a sustained period of time, we can avoid large-scale community transmission. We have seen that we can avoid large-scale lockdowns in that situation or some countries have managed to do that, they've taken another path. Um, but it has to be done with great consistency and great persistence. Uh, Notwithstanding that, uh, when the lockdowns or when the so-called lockdowns, public health and social measures happened, uh, they put everybody at home, not just symptomatic or asymptomatic. So they had a great impact because they stopped all forms of transmission for a couple of weeks. Now that people are coming back to their daily lives, we see those small spikes in cases. And we now have to determine uh, how can we make sure that those small spikes, new clusters, don't turn into big ones, big ones big into ones. big new peaks. And that's why we believe uh, uh, sticking with our strategy right now, that comprehensive strategy, is the best way to avoid that. Yeah. So this is a Facebook Live, and we're on Twitter, and we're on LinkedIn, and the point is to take questions from the audience as well. Um, so we have a question here from Tanya Riggin, who asks, what's the difference between asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission, or people? Who would like to take that one? So I can start? Uh, so this is a good question um, because the use of the word asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, symptomatic, symptomatic um, is, is confusing um, and it's not always used consistently by, by different groups. So when we say asymptomatic, we mean somebody that does not have symptoms and does not go on to develop symptoms. Truly no symptoms. Um, and that's what we mean when we say this. Um, and when we read this in papers, that's what we expect to see. Um, and when we talk to people, that's what we expect to see. But in fact, sometimes when you go back um, and you, you talk about a population or you say a little bit, um, some, not all, because there is asymptomatic infection, some have some mild disease. And so it may not, they may not quite register that I'm sick. You know, it's, I just feel a little bit unwell. I'm just a little bit under the weather. I'm feeling a little bit fatigued. Um, and some of those individuals um, we would classify as pre-symptomatic, which means they have not yet developed symptoms. Um, so we know from some of the viral shedding studies from some of the lab work that there are people who are infected with COVID-19 that can, that can be PCR positive, that can test positive one to three days before they develop symptoms. And that's something that we've known for, for quite some time now. What we need to better understand, and this is one of the major unknowns, is, is what proportion is that is contributing to transmission. Um, and then we have symptomatic people. So we have people who have um, known symptoms of COVID and those symptoms have been changing over time. I think in the beginning we focused a lot on respiratory symptoms. We focused on fever, uh, sore throat, generally feeling unwell. And as this pandemic has evolved, we've learned a lot more. We've heard about like a loss of taste, a loss of smell. Um, you know, so that is something that is changing too. But when we say symptomatic, we mean people that actually have any type of symptom um, related to COVID-19 and we're learning about what that means to be related to COVID-19 as well. Um, many people have asked this one. We talked about our mask guidance as well, and people have associated it with the idea that there's a lot of transmission happening from people who are asymptomatic, and that's why perhaps at this point we recommended more circumstances under which people should wear masks. So a few people have asked, can you explain what WHO's current guidance is on masks. We did a Facebook Live on this uh, just yesterday, so if you really want details on that, you can go there. But because of this link with asymptomatic, can you explain how our guidance relates to asymptomatic and what we are saying about when and where to wear, when and where to wear masks? It's tricky. So yes, we can. So we published guidance on Friday and we dis we've discussed this at the presser and in the Facebook. Um, our recommendations for the general public, what is new in that guidance, um, is that we recommend the use of a fabric mask for people in the general community living in areas where there's community, where there's transmission, where there's active transmission and they can't practice physical distancing. So when they're in crowded situations, um, such as public transportation, for example, or in some kind of closed settings, 
we recommend the use of a fabric mask. Um, and part of that is because for source control, and when you put on this fabric mask, and in the guidance we actually put out information on the types of materials that can be used to act as a barrier. So if you yourself are infected, and you may not know it yet, because there is the possibility of asymptomatic transmission or pre-symptomatic transmission, if you put that fabric mask on, the, the, uh, you reduce that opportunity to transmit to someone else. So that was the key thing that we, we put in the guidance out on Friday that was new. So it is, it is a lot of detail. We know it's not a simple wear or don't wear masks, and that's why you, we suggest you do some more reading. We've got um, infographics, we have videos that help explain this a bit better. Also, for those of you for whom English is not a first language or living in other parts of the world, go to the WHO regional websites and the country websites and you'll see materials there in your languages as well. Um, there's some people who are asking why we're not wearing masks and that's because we are able, the way our, our studio team has set this up, we are able to be more than a meter apart so we don't need to wear masks to protect, I don't need to wear a mask to protect her from me and likewise for Mike. So that's the answer on that one. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, so we have on Facebook, uh, Fatima Sabur on Facebook asks, what are the transmission modes of COVID from an asymptomatic patient? So as we've said before, when someone has, is coughing, they're pushing the virus out. So if a person doesn't have symptoms, how are they transmitting the virus to someone else? Well, we've, uh well, that, that is a, a an excellent question because it actually speaks to, to, the, to the heart of the issue is to what extent is the presence of the virus in the upper respiratory and that's the difference between maybe SARS and, 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 and COVID-19 and MERS in that this virus is present in the upper respiratory tract and in, in, in SARS and MERS the, the virus tends to be isolated from the lower respiratory tract and therefore it's obviously much harder for that virus to get out, it has to be expelled as such or it's harder to breathe it out. So in this case there's no question that the, the viral loads that have been estimated in the upper respiratory tract would indicate that the, the virus is there and it's present. Uh, the question remains is how does the virus get from being inside your nose or inside your pharynx to being on somebody else? Um, and it's fairly obvious in a symptomatic patient if I cough or I sneeze or I contaminate my hands with a cough and sneeze and then touch a surface that someone could be exposed to that. The, the question and the good question is well how does someone who's asymptomatic do that? And there's some very interesting observational studies done looking at how, how is that potentially happening? What is the, the root of that? And uh, uh, in, in some cases, and, and some studies have been done on this uh, around you know, singing, speaking loudly, um, exertion, uh, maybe in a gym where you're breathing very heavily. So any, any, any situation in which you're likely to uh, uh, express air under pressure, so when you sing or you're shouting in a nightclub because you can't hear your friend and you're saying, you know, can mm. you hear me? Mm. And you're, you're close by and you're projecting your voice at someone, then it's clear that in that situation, if the virus is present in your upper respiratory mucosa, then there's every likelihood that you can project that virus. And some of the cluster investigations that were done, for example, in the likes of Japan, mm -hmm. showed that some of these environments, like in gyms and in choir situations and in nightclub situations, karaoke that's clubs karaoke so clubs, yep. that's where they got that transmission. So it's really interesting to look at that dynamic. So there is a mechanical means of projecting this virus, uh, um, and clearly that, has, that is playing a part in, in transmission. There's no, there's no question. The question is, what proportion of overall transmission has been driven by that route of transmission? Um, and then, uh, if that is the case, then uh, is the what we're doing now, a contact tracing and everything else, you say, well, it's not worth doing that if all of the disease has been spread by the other route. But what, what has been proven the opposite is countries that are doing really good public health work, really f investigating clusters and finding cases and identifying contacts and quarantining those contacts. In those situations, countries are having great success in suppressing the infection. So it's clear that both symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals are part of the transmission cycle. Mm -hmm. The question is, what is the relative contribution of each group to the overall number of cases? Yeah. And what is clear is that if we can remove and sort of identify those who are symptomatic and, and give them an opportunity to be isolated and cared for, um, and also give their uh, contacts the same opportunity to be quarantined with support, and that's another issue when we talk about things like quarantine. It's not a simple, it's not a simple measure. 
Uh, someone who goes into quarantine for 14 days needs to be supported in that process. If they're staying at home, they need to get food. And we've all seen that with the lockdowns, how difficult it is. But in our view, uh, going forward, we need to be in a position where we don't have to lock down the whole of society again, where 100% of the population have to effectively go into quarantine. And we have some choices to make as a society, because it is clear, if we can identify cases and their contacts, and we ask those contacts to quarantine themselves, and we support them in that quarantine, that that can be a very successful way of both stopping the disease and avoiding uh, large-scale lockdowns in the future. So, Mike, you said that when people uh, speak and expel air, but mm -hmm. I think it's important to clarify, in that air, there's droplets mm -hmm. of, yeah. of liquids from mm -hmm. inside the bodies, because yeah. it's mm -hmm. really those droplets that transmit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have a LinkedIn question here. Are there any groups of people who are more likely to be asymptomatic, for example, by age or by gender? So that's another, ex that's an excellent question. So I, I there's, the, how are we actually finding these asymptomatic people? Where do they come from? Um, many of them early on in the outbreak, in the pandemic, we, they were coming from contact tracing. So these were close contacts of known symptomatic cases who tend to be family members, for example, because mm. a lot of the transmission was in households. So they would be uh, loved ones that live in the house. They could be older, they could be younger. Um, now what we're seeing is um, the asymptomatic or, or asymptomatic individuals are being found in outbreaks in these um, outbreaks in expat dormitories, for example. And so in this situation, you're doing a lot of testing. You're actually looking, there's many countries that are looking for the virus. And this is, this is part of the strategy to bring the virus under control. Um, and in many of those asymptomatic people to be, and again, there's still a lot of unknowns here, so I don't wanna overgeneralize, but asymptomatic people who are positive tend to be younger, tend to be people without underlying conditions. Um, but again, I don't want to overgeneralize what we know right now because there's still so much unknown and we're not systematically testing. Our strategy for suppressing virus and saving lives relates to testing suspect cases and testing contacts who develop symptoms. And so in that strategy, you, you may miss asymptomatic cases, but in outbreaks and in, in certain types of situations, they're, test, they're doing more broader testing. Um, and that's where we're learning a bit more about those asymptomatic cases. Yeah, and, and maybe I could just add to that because th I think this is an important point. Countries don't want to do more extensive testing. That is really to do with the resources in the country and what the government can achieve with broader testing and more popular. But at the core, you need to be testing the suspect cases. Yeah. So it, there's no point just doing, uh, you need to target your testing uh, and target that testing against those individuals who are likely to have the disease so you can identify their contacts and break the chains of transmission. If in addition to that process, you can do further testing, you can, for example, do uh, preemptive testing in long-term care facilities or test health workers or other things, then yes, that's a good way of managing risk. But just doing blind population-based testing without doing those other things, I think at this stage is you'd have to really question whether that's the best use of resources. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have to use your, and particularly in developing countries who don't have access to massive amounts of testing, they really have to use the resources carefully and they have to use them wisely and they have to use them tactically. And I do think in that sense, we need to focus in on diagnosing suspect cases identifying their contacts, quarantining contacts, supporting those contacts in quarantine, and using that as a primary strategy. Uh, and testing is part of that. If you have uh, a further capacity to test and you can do more, absolutely, please do. But uh, you do need to use your testing as part of your surveillance and control strategy as well in a targeted way. And WHO has guidance um, on that as well, suggesting mm. uh, what kind of strategies countries can consider. It's yes. not what they have to do, but we have that out there so people can consider it. Yeah, what we've done is we've tried to support countries based on the type of transmission scenario they're in. You know, what are they facing? Do they have a few cases? Do they have clusters of cases? Do they have, you know, widespread community transmission? And, and that will in, make countries have to prioritize the use of what they have. Um, and so what we've, what we've done is we've tried to provide guidance to support them in, in the best use of the resources that they have. Take a few more questions here. We have one from Jen Steinhardt. She's asking, are there studies that suggest when patients are the most contagious? I imagine it's still difficult to say, but curious to know what we know so far. 
So that's another really excellent question. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should do more of these. No, that's a really excellent question, and, and that's another one of the big unknowns is, is not only who is, is transmitting to others, it's when are they transmitting to others. And so data here is very preliminary. Um, and again, we're working with a number of countries and labs, and, and we ask all of our member states to help us answer these questions um, to better understand when people are most infectious. What we have are some, a few studies, again, it's, it's limited information, um, on when people test positive through PCR testing and when they may have more viral load is what we say. It's more particles that-, that A lot of virus. A lot of body. virus in their body, thank you. Um, and it appears from very limited information that we have so far that people have more virus in their body at or around the time that they develop symptoms. So very early on. Um, which is different than the profile that we saw with SARS. Um, and so that means we, we don't know actually when people are most infectious, but, but from that information, um, people with, with more virus in their body may be able to, to spread more early on in infection. And then that tails off. Um, what we don't know well yet is sort of the upper bound of like how long are people infectious. There's some preliminary studies from Germany, from the United States um, that suggest that, that it could be up to eight, nine days for mild patients, but it could be a lot longer for people who are more severely ill. And that's why it's really important that cases are isolated and cared for appropriately so that, that we, we prevent that potential for onward transmission. But again, it's still early days and it's still, you know, we're trying to gather this information to help us really understand when people are most infectious. And we're really, it's very important across all of infectious disease control. If we look at Ebola, I'm dealing with another Ebola outbreak in Congo right now, people uh, tend not to be infectious at all until they get their fever and sometimes for a number of days afterwards. So if you can detect everyone that has the fever, then you're sure that you're, that you're, you're, you're able to, to protect others and break the chains of transmission. It's the same, it was the same in SARS because people didn't tend to be infectious as early in the course of disease because the virus was in their lower respiratory airway. It was harder to infect others. So it's both, uh, you need to look at the timing at which someone becomes infectious and also where they're being infectious from, how easy it is for them to pass the disease from one person to another. So in this case, with some, now as we look at COVID-19, we have an infectious pathogen that's present in the upper airway for which the viral loads are peaking at the time that you're just beginning to get sick. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that means you could be in the restaurant uh, feeling perfectly well and start to get or a some, fever. Some Somewhat well. you're feeling okay. You didn't think Good you need to, to stay home. Mm -hmm. But that's the moment at which your viral load could be actually quite high. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and, uh, and I think they're the kind of reasons why mass guidance and others is to say, well, in situations you can't physically distance, there is this period of time when, you know, uh, even a professor of infectious diseases themselves wouldn't know that I'm getting COVID. There is that hours or days in which uh, you're not that unwell or you could be becoming unwell, you're not aware of your status. And it's because the disease can spread at that moment that the disease is so contagious. That's why it's spread around the world mm -hmm. in such a, an, an uncontained way is because it's hard to stop this virus. But if it's this, still possible. If this, it's still possible. It if this virus possible. was easy to stop, everyone would, would be doing it, it, right? It's not easy to stop. It isn't easy to stop. But what some countries have shown uh, many countries have shown is if you go at this in a very systematic way and you use a comprehensive approach that there is enough stoppability in the virus. It's not it's so transmissible that you cannot suppress. We've seen that with the physical measures, uh, social distancing, we've seen it with, uh, with surveillance. You put all of these things together mm -hmm. and you just double down on your bets and say we're going to do everything. Countries have clearly so shown that you can have an impact on the virus transmission and you can bring transmission down to an acceptable level or even to no level, right. as our colleagues in New Zealand have recently demonstrated. Uh, so I think that's an important part of this. It's one thing, you know, we have to admit, and everyone needs, and we've seen it, this is not an easy virus to stop. But we have to do our best. And just because something is not easy to stop, it, you can't throw up your hands and say, well, it's, it can't be stopped. There's a difference between not easy to stop and can't be stopped. And I think while there are still many unknowns, uh, we know enough, I think, that 
we need to, and if we're coming into a period, we, people have seen now in Europe and North America that the disease is, 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 is to a great extent on the decrease of many countries. But that is not the case in Central Asia. That is not the case in Africa. That is not the case again in the Middle East. That is not the case in Latin America. Uh, I think yeah, the last couple of days have been the highest number of daily cases uh, in the world. So in terms of pandemic generation, we are still very much on the, up, on the upward climb on this mountain. Uh, and therefore, we have to implement the measures that we believe will be associated with controlling the disease. Because um, we've seen it. Because we've seen it work in other situations, yeah. yeah. And that's we wish those, uh, those countries, that's what we're here to provide the best possible technical advice. No one has all the answers. No one has all the knowledge. The real trick is pulling all of that knowledge, pulling those answers together, together and working together to give the best possible scientific advice that drives policy at national level. In the end of the day, WHO doesn't tell countries what to do. Countries decide what they do in terms of policy. And they gather their own scientific information, and you've seen that. Many countries have their own scientific committees, they have their own modeling groups, they have their own clinical groups. Our job in WHO is to synthesize that at a global level, because some countries don't have access to that knowledge, but also it's always good to have a second opinion. It's always good to have your own national uh, process and then look at what the rest of the world is doing. And the more we do that and the more we learn from each other, the more likely it is we will gain new knowledge. And then in one month's time, two months' time, in five months' time, we will know more and we'll be sitting at this desk <laughs> answering other unknown questions about this virus uh, uh, and I think that will continue. Look at Ebola. We're still ans asking questions about Ebola virus. I've been responding to Ebola virus outbreaks for 25 years, and I still have more questions than answers. That is, unfortunately, uh, the science and infectious diseases. We do not understand the microbial world, and particularly the emerging microbial world, as well as we should. You're, uh, I think, Nick, I was just going to add, I think, I think it's important that people understand that what we do here is in this consolidation, in this summarizing, in this pulling together is it's, it's, it's science, it's debate, it's public health, it's practical, it's, it's iterative, it changes all the time and it's dynamic. Um, and as Mike said, every question we answer, we have 10 more. So we're trying to slowly gain knowledge and slowly gain a better understanding of, of, you know, what is the transmission, what is the severity, and then how do we stop this? And as Mike has said, we do have the tools. We have a number of tools that are shown to be able to suppress transmission, and we focus on those and we double down and we work really hard while being open to innovation. And so even with this mass guidance that came out, the innovation and the fabrics, and the, I mean, that is something that should be celebrated and is welcomed and, and we need more of that. So we work with all of you, we work with all of our member states, we work with academic partners, you know, to try to, to learn more every single day. And, and that is something that we are committed to and we are committed to working really hard to put out the best guidance that we possibly can. I think people sometimes find it frustrating that uh, we don't just have one answer and it stays the same. And short, um, a short exactly. answer. Exactly. Yeah. And so it is, yeah. but that's what you've hired us to do in a way, is to synthesize all the information and um, learn from it, explain it, and then adjust it as more information comes in. Yes, but we also need to, and it is a, it is a debate. And, uh, you know, you can see yesterday, and as you said, this was, you know, quite a, a big reaction to, to, to Maria's response on the question. And, and, and so there should be, we need that debate. Yeah. And if, 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 if people out there, if journalists and, and the public think that we're, we're straying away from evidence, then fine, you know, that's what this is for. Yeah. If, we, if they think there isn't a basis for what we're saying, then let's have that debate one-on-one. -on -one. That's why we're here. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, we didn't, that was not intended. No. That was not the intention of the statement. No. But you know what, it's better to be having this narrative, having this discussion. It's not behind closed doors. It's happening in the open. We're happy to continue this dialogue. Uh, because we're open and we're transparent and we want that and we are concerned if people misinterpret what we say we don't want that to be the case uh, so I, I, I really you know this is a really positive way of, it, of, of engaging on, on these issues but uh, we do need to separate what is WHO's policy and what we're putting out as documents saying this is what the world needs to do from what is a, a response to a question in which one part of that question was, was, was clearly uh, misinterpreted or maybe we didn't use the most elegant words uh, to explain that. But uh, that's, I, I think, is a, I don't see that as a challenge. I see that as an opportunity to better explain where we are with issues around transmission, which has been a good opportunity today. 
So we've got a couple more questions and then we'll go over the countries. I know, I know, I know you want to wrap, but the, we've, we're out here. We've got to answer those questions. Um, we've got one from Beth uh, Skorecki. <laughs> you keep in line, Dr. Ryan. Uh, she's a reporter with Life Hacker and wants to know, I already know we don't have an answer to this one, but let's, it's an interesting question. Do we know how much transmission is from people who currently have no symptoms? So not truly asymptomatic, but those pre-symptomatic people who might be out having lunch today, not knowing that they will be feeling sick tonight. Do we have any estimate or guesstimate around something like that? The short answer is no. I mean, the, the short answer is, is these are the types of studies that we need, we need to, to better understand, which is why all of these elements of physical distancing and hand washing, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette and following the leaders of stay at home orders if, if necessary, that's why all of that is really, really critical. Why you wear a mask in areas of community transmission and you can't do physical distancing. It's why all of this comprehensive approach is critical. And then uh, Serena Chern also asked a question, do you think there's new modes of transmission that will come out? So at the moment we know it's droplets and those droplets either fly straight you know, from my mouth to your eyeballs or they fall on the surface and then somebody touches the surface and touches their own eyeballs or mouth or nose. Um, do you think there's other ways that it could emerge that COVID is spreading over time? Do you think we'll learn about some other modes of transmission? We, we may do, uh, I mean, Certainly, the, there's been speculation around fecal oral or transmission through the gastrointestinal route. I, I don't see much evidence at this point for that. I've mm -hmm. seen studies that show the presence of RNA of viral particles, but we haven't seen any clear demonstration of transmission by that route. And that would be a concern if that were to be the case. Uh, but clearly, at this point, the, the, the overwhelming evidence points to a respiratory uh, droplet spread yeah. infection or spread through uh, yeah. through fomites and contamination of your respiratory mucosa or ocular mucosa. But we need to keep an open mind on that uh, because uh, uh, we've seen uh, other diseases which have multiple routes of transmission and we just need to be, be careful to uh, keep a very open mind on these issues. The exception to that is the aerosol in areas in hospitals where they're performing these aerosol generating procedures where they can make smaller, more fine, fine particles. That's where we make different recommendations for healthcare workers and we recommend airborne precautions. So I just wanted to highlight that in, a, in, in health facilities. Thanks for that. So now I'm going to uh, list all the countries where our followers are from. We do this in all of our uh, lives. Um, when we do these live sessions. Mike, you might want to take off your microphone and get back to leading the response, but I'll be quick. So our LinkedIn followers have come from Argentina, Malaysia, Namibia, the US, Bangladesh, Portugal, Netherlands, India, Indonesia, Macedonia, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Belize, Pakistan, India, Colombia, Guatemala, I'm only halfway through, uh, Namibia, Vietnam, England, Nicaragua, Turkey, Mauritania, Malaysia, Iran, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Nigeria, Brazil, Poland, France, Venezuela, Egypt, Mexico, Bahrain, Tanzania, Kenya, Italy, Spain, Bolivia, Sudan, Iraq, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Canada, and Eswatini. Thank you so much for following us on whatever platform you followed us on today. Keep tuning in for other Facebook Lives. Um, check out your regional office as well. They do press conferences multiple times per week. Look at the WHO website for your country office, for the, if there's a WHO office in your country. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, our technical lead for COVID, for being with us, and Dr. Mike Ryan, the head of WHO's emergencies program. I'm Nika Alexander from the communications team here at WHO. Thanks for being with us.